I don't know how much you know about Rambus. Rambus is a, a semiconductor invention company, and it's had a pretty fundamental impact on computing as we know it. You know, moving data faster and safer has really been the, the theme behind Rambus, and some of the fundamental technologies and benefits of computing that we appreciate came out of some of the inventions of Rambus. But one of the challenges of this invention mindset is often these inventions are done in isolation. There's not a user orientation to them. And the notion of minimum viable product, which is a theme I'm pushing within, suggests that we can't just look at the minimal ingredient inventions that we are creating. We need to understand at a systems level or at an end user level what their impact will be. And, and to that end, this technology that you're going to hear about, this lensless smart sensor that's an optic array that is remarkably small, is incredibly power efficient, and we feel has great opportunity in the Internet of Things, was born out of physics and mathematics. It was really a set of researchers saying that we can get rid of standard lens optics, a refractive lens that focuses an image on a sensor and use a diffraction grating which is a small disk with a known pattern in it that lets light through, and then algorithms can interpret the light that was passed through that disk and interpret what it means with adequate acuity for certain tasks. So once we understood the capabilities of this, we encouraged that we take this technology and put it into the form of a what we call the pod kit, a partners in open development kit, which you're going to hear was basically a Raspberry Pi board with the sensors affixed to it, some firmware, a limited SDK, and some APIs. And then we wanted to give it out to the maker community. And we came back to our dear friends at Frog, who we worked with before. I've known Ray Toe for a while, and I said, I think you would be an excellent collaborator as well. And what they've come up with, guided by the verticals where we think there could be opportunity, <coughs> is truly amazing. Um, again, this is a second readout that we've done, and we're far from done. You know, the intent was to catalyze this approach for Rambus and leverage the expertise and the, the creativity of these two groups. And you're going to see a set of MVP prototypes, minimum viable product prototypes, that demonstrate the capabilities of this technology. The hope and desire is that we're going to get more ideas from all of you. And there might be further interest in taking these kits and seeing what other vertical applications you think they might have. So with that, um, Elliot's sort of driving over here, you see our website, and this is not promotion about Rambus or the website, but I thought it would be interesting to look within the site, and you see we have four key areas. We focus on memory and interfaces, essentially moving data quickly through computing systems, and more and more with big data, analytics, and, 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 and server, um, that becomes important. We have a division on security, but on the far right you see emerging solutions, so let's go there. And within this emerging solutions group, and you see really looking at the world's data reimagined, we have a set of upstream research programs, and this is one of them, the Lensless Smart Sensor. And in here you're going to see, much like what we're doing today, we had a session last month, and this is a brief two-minute video that's a takeaway of some of what happened there. And I think you're going to see a set of things in here. You're going to see some of the prototypes, just as a preview of what you're going to see today. But more than that, you see some great, creative, high-energy people buzzing around, feeling the capabilities of both the approach and the technology. And uh, I guess we begin with uh, the good-looking Carlos over here is going to be speaking for Frog in a bit. So let's take a couple of minutes, look at this, and then I'll close and we'll get going there. All right, Elliot. So I'm here at Frog Design in the heart of San Francisco to celebrate the LSS Partners in Open Development Program. Partners in Open Development Program is the very first time when we've taken LSS we've given it to some party outside of Randall's that it's impossible to do with these lensless smart sensors. What's amazing about this sensor is that it's able to capture images that only a computer can understand and and then provide you with information about what that is. It's really revolutionary and one of a kind. This is a momentous occasion in the transformation of Memphis. I joined three years ago and immediately had met some brilliant engineers and scientists and inventors. I felt at that time that the company could shift its model to be more open to leverage some of the concepts and technologies that are in the house. And not only did we come back to engage fraud, but we brought in a small 
smaller uh, drill land called IX Dunes, and it has been a wonderful collaboration. I think the, the most exciting Who's this guy? Getting feedback from the industry and the fundamental research. So working with Ramis is fantastic in the sense that there are a company of inventors, and so we had access to really, really intelligent, driven people who have the opportunity to work with their technology. Both groups are creative, interesting, uh, productive. I'm, I'm really impressed. For them to actually build the prototypes to make these systems work <coughs> and real so that we can show customers is invaluable. So design thinking from the method yields great results. And we are seeing that at Rambus to, to think big and to think design. Rambus and our partners have been able to do is amazing. But it's only the beginning. Wait till you see what we do next. So that was just a preview. Now we get on to the real thing. So there's just some brilliant concepts that have you know, been sort of codified in actual working prototypes. And this is not just a one-way presentation. It's really going to be a discussion in the second part to get your input over here as well. So Elliot's going to come up next, speak about the agenda for today. There's going to be a brief introduction to the technology, to the formation of the pod kit, to the assignment that we gave to both Rayto and team and Carlos and team. And then we'll be getting presentations, I believe, first from Frog on what they've come up with and then from, from uh, Rayto's team as well. So thank you so much for being here. We're really looking forward to a great morning and a good uh, dialogue and interaction. Thank you. So you've just seen, heard from Jerome about some of the context for this new sensor that was invented at Rambus, and you saw a little bit of video but I'm going to talk a little bit now about what exactly this thing is so that you can see these prototypes and the, the concepts that were created that you know what's, what's really beneath that from a, from a technology perspective. So the Lens of Smart Sensor was, was sort of a combination of two things. One was some PhD research that was done by Dr. Patrick Gill at Rambus and then working at Rambus with David Stork to, to look at new ways of of building lenses and imaging sensors that got rid of the actual the, the refractive traditional refractive <coughs> lens and approach a space that was really not practically achievable with the traditional lens system. And then that sort of combined with a, a what's going on in IoT, which is probably not new to most of us, but there's an explosion of devices. And the problem is that the the data that's generated by those devices is, is far outstripping the growth and the capacity to process that data uh, at a systems level. So what we're finding is that you need to, in order to be able to manage that much data, you need to pre-process it, process it at, the, at the IoT object or sensor level so that it's more streamlined when it actually gets, gets sent out to the systems that, that make meaning of it. So at a marketing level, what, we, what that requires is that you actually have this processing going on, um, but that you have, you have a sensor that can actually do that at a, at a, a cost-effective level and a low-power level as well. Um, and then, so that combined with this research was done on imaging, really allowed Rambus to develop this new kind of sensor that is showing great promise in the IoT. And what we call it, is the, the eyes of the IoT because what it really is is it's not a 16 megapixel camera and we'll talk more about that. It's really a device that lets devices sense their surroundings and respond to their surroundings. And as Rachel mentioned, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, it's, it's taken the processing away <coughs> from the actual image and put the image construction into the, the algorithmic world. So it's sort of sensing as an application. And when you can do that, you can do many different things with, with the information that comes through with the light information. So here it is. This is the this is a test chip that we had created, and, and if you see up at the upper left there, that's the tip of a ballpoint pen. This is the sensor, and the actual lens, the grating, is right here within that dock, and you can't even really see it. It's so small. So it's tiny, and it requires super high power to operate. And it, it, as I said, it's moving the processing from the from the from the, the 
lends to actual so the, the software that's, that's manipulating it afterwards. Um, and as I said, it's not a camera. We, we, we try to get people away from the understanding that this is a camera, um, but it, what it does is it allows you to do smart sensing. Here's another image for more, for more context on what it, what it looks like. So on the left is a human hair, and it's 55 microns. You see some measurement there, but the real grading that we have is a spiral pattern, and it's 55 microns width. Um, it's tiny, tiny, you can hardly even see it. If you look at what a traditional lens system looks like on the left, there's a whole stack of hardware that's involved. It's complex. Um, it has many elements that cause the form factor to be large, and it's relatively fragile. That little thing on the right there is our sensor. And it takes all of the things on the left and puts them in one sensor. It's, it's designed and built with a semiconductor manufacturing process, so it's robust. It has temperature range uh, robustness as well as, as physical robustness to it. And then to the right of that, you see the raw image. What you get through this grating is not a focused image. There's no focal plane. What you get is light field, light data, and it, what we call this the blob. And it's not, it's not, you can't understand the image at a, at a, at a, at a level that you would a normal image. But what they do is they use the Fourier algorithms and software and reconstruct the image from the light data because you know the patterns of that as it goes through this grating and as it defracts. And so on the right is the reconstructed image. You can see the hand, you can see the wedding ring on the hand. As well, that's Patrick, the guy you saw in the video. So that's his hand. Uh, but what you can see, it's, it's not a high res image, but it, it is his vision. And that's a very new and very different thing for, for this world. A little bit more information for the, for the more geeky side of things. As I said, it's 55 microns diameter. The die itself is 2 millimeters. Um, super low power on a coin, coin size battery. It can run in the wake up mode. It has an inherent wake up mode built into it for 10 years. So we're talking this could go into space, it could go all kinds of places and not have to have you know, extra power. Um, super wide, wide field of view. Um, it can also capture still frames as well as video. Um, Patrick at one point came back into uh, one of our meetings and said, hey, I put two of them together. And he created range detection binocular vision. But they were separated by 1.6 millimeters to do that. And it was incredible to see him say, oh, now we can do that. And he did some other things with, with three-dimensional uh, sensing with red, green, and things like that. But it's just, this is just goes to say that, uh, goes to demonstrate that it's a, it's a really flexible and interesting technology. Uh, we're also looking at uh, visible <coughs> near IR and then, and then thermal IR is something that we're, we'll, James will talk about in a minute. Just at an overview level, what are the things that, that LXS is good at? I, min I mentioned um, some of them, but change detection because you can, you can recognize symbols. <coughs> You can actually, you can actually uh, use the wake-up mode if something happens in space. You wake up the sensor and you capture the image or capture the video. Um, shape recognition, so symboling or other kinds of things that you'll see here later with some of the prototypes. Um, the, the sensor can read it, read it, it signs and then react to that. Um, gesture recognition. Um, we also, without actually processing the information, there are also things that it can do with, with point source lighting. So you can actually be more efficiently than having to re reconstitute an image. You can actually have it read a point source and react to that as well. Um, eye tracking, you see some prototypes around that. Um, and we talked about, I uh, talked about low power monitoring, wake up mode. So James, you want to talk about some of the hardware and software? So we're getting into now what, what was involved in the kits that were given to Frog and XDS. <laughs> Good morning. I'm James Tringali, I'm part of the uh, Nuts and Bolts team, put, uh, putting the hardware together to showcase this technology. Um, my, my partner's here, Mark and Evan, will uh, join us and we talk about some future stuff we're working on. What I'm going to go over really, oh, over really quickly. It's just for a quarter. It's just for a quarter. Detail, so um, Elliot just went through the uh, kind of high-level stuff. What we did is we took the, 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 the chip you saw, which is a 2 millimeter by 2 millimeter um, IC with the grain attached, and we decided to put it into a form factor that would be the most approachable thing for people to do hacking with. So we kind of focused immediately on the maker space, if you will. 
We had some work we've done some work originally on the Arduino platform, but it became clear after talking with Frog and XDS initially that a better platform for their work would be the Raspberry Pi. So we also recorded our stuff over to that and did a lot more work in that area. So the kit uh, is high focused. It contains a, uh, a little hat, which is a standard card that you can uh, add uh, expansion modules into the Raspberry Pi. We built a hat. It holds the sensor, or holds two connectors that could uh, cable to the sensor. Uh, we have on the, uh, on the board, there's an FPGA. It's, it's there to basically uh, help get the frame rate up, but there's also some things we can do later on. We think uh, before it's malware, there's some hardware in there. Um, and there's two, uh, two cables on it. The daughter card, <coughs> this would be nice to have it way around. There's a, uh, the daughter card is a little tiny uh, uh, PCB with a, a prototype uh, package on it, so it's huge compared to the little tiny chip that's on it. But that card, we have two of those um, that you can hook with a standard Raspberry Pi camera cable to the uh, daughter card, so you can have two sensors on the box. The idea was you need one to do if you want to do just some kind of visual reconstruction and reviewing, on um, two, maybe to do some kind of disparity thing to be range of um, We also see daughter card and the standard hat. Okay. Oh, and the daughter card contains all the, uh, the regulators and things you need to. The, the, the more important thing, I guess, for the development was uh, the hardware was there and working, but we needed to facilitate it all the way out so you could build an application. So we put together a couple layers of software. Uh, there's a driver that goes with it. Um, and basically, you get the standard Raspberry and <coughs> distribution on it. We, we have a lot of OpenCV and some other tools. We didn't develop, but we need to. We use them, they're very useful for doing processing for it. The key two uh, things we're delivering at the bottom, software-wise, the driver, which talks to the device through a SPI interface. So that would be the, if, if you wanted to interface this into some other system, if you have an SPI interface, that work is easily done. Expose all the register sets and set up the different features. We have a GPIO-based uh, interface that allows people to, to do the uh, high-speed streaming um, mode for the bulk devices. And then, more importantly, the thing we mostly interface with is our image processing library. We put together a toolkit that allows you to do image reconstruction, and we have a range finding application as well. So, uh, put some example tutorials in, just like you'd see in a normal distribution for any of these maker kits. Uh, you get a, a bunch of tools and you can compile your own stuff, you get some example programs to go from to, to build your first application to go from there. And that's what basically both of these teams did. They took the software, they looked at what we did. So that's all fine and good. We have some other great ideas, and they coupled together bits and pieces and added their own stuff. And you're going to see that that workshop be through the same. But in a nutshell, that's the uh, hardware and software that's uh, in the, the kits. So here's my visual idea. Um, this here, it's kind of funny. We have all this hardware, but it's all just that little tiny uh, sensor, the little tiny chip in the middle. It's a two millimeter chip, but you really only 300 microns by 300 microns square of the chip actually senses image data at all. And within that that square, you only really look through a, an image, a, a, a hole that's 55 microns wide. So you can almost see, if you look really carefully, there's a the grating kind of laying on top of the chip in the, in the middle of that giant hole thing. Anyway, this guard card here is attached in this picture, but it's made to come off and on a fly wire with this uh, standard uh, Raspberry Pi cable. It doesn't use the Raspberry Pi interface, it, it is our interface, <coughs> but it is the off the shelf cable. This is the, uh, the hat board that we built, a smart hat over in North Carolina put together. It has the FPGA on it and uh, the connectors for the board and then underneath the standard Raspberry Pi. Uh, we use the latest and greatest of uh, any of the Pi's on the board. I think that's. Uh, so there was a lot of information here when you think about three simple things package power price okay so you know this started as a technology that historically Rambus would have held as its own intellectual property we wanted to come out and understand what does the community feel we can do around this technology? How could we apply it? So from a, from a package size, it's remarkably small. 
from a power size, it's remarkably efficient. And from a price point size, we feel that it could be manufactured at low cost. So think in that way when you're looking at the examples that have been shared and how that might fit in the things you're working on or the applications that you support. Okay. 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 So these are our friends from Frog uh, who came uh, all the way uh, from California, from San Francisco today. So a warm welcome to Montes and Chuck. Wearables, one is um, 
autonomous vehicles that come with mid-range and then <coughs> smart cities. And within those, we focused on three specific sort of um, applications. One is eye tracking. So imagining, you know, with the smallness of the sensor, if it just completely disappeared in the eyes um, or in, in your eyeglasses, how that could be how that could be used. Um, autonomous vehicles, and more specifically, at drones. Uh, obviously, the low power and the low weight would be very advantageous for uh, different applications in that space. And then, because of the low power and the fact that it can run a, a small battery for like five years, you know, imagining that you could attach this to the existing infrastructure within a city and have it be completely isolated on its own. Um, so the first one we'll start with, and we've got a concept video for each one of these that I'll, I'll let kind of do most of the talking, but just real quickly, the eye tracking one, we, um, it's used um, typically for research, you know, for user interaction <coughs> research, and also for um, helping the disabled, uh, quadriplegics and things of that nature, uh, or observing um, fatigue in drivers, it's being uh, utilized more and more for that, but um, and we were really surpri uh, surprised and also kind of intrigued by some of the experts that we talked to in virtual reality and augmented reality who are using eye tracking more and more or want to in a lot of the applications that they're building. So, video Today's eye tracking solutions are too large to be placed on glasses or on a person without drawing attention. By embedding the miniature sensors into wearables, we can capture and respond to a person's natural behavior. LSS opens the breadth of applications with a more affordable and nearly invisible solution. Eye tracking covers a range of applications across industries. Historically, the technology has been used for market research. The advent of mobile devices and wearables has ushered in a new age of opportunities that include virtual reality and assistive technology for the disabled. Through multiple prototypes, we've refined the accuracy and effectiveness, moving from visual light to different configurations of IR illumination to track the eye. As wearable technologies proliferate, eye tracking will become a key differentiator for creating contextually aware and responsive experiences. Today, we miss out on nonverbal communication and intent that the eyes communicate. Tomorrow, with LSS, we can change the way people interact and interface with technology and their surroundings. So that last cut was kind of... Quick, quick question. Did everyone hear that already? Back there? Yeah. Okay, great. That last comment was kind of a reference to uh, an expert that we talked to in augmented reality that they were talking about how they were <coughs> intrigued by using eye tracking to tell whether or not a user is engaging uh, a real world or a digital system that they're trying to lay out information on. Uh, we've got a prototype back here that you can try it later where you can see what your eye looks like inside. we got some rudimentary tracking working in kind of the six weeks in the midst of working on other prototypes. So uh, I can answer questions on that later. The second prototype that we worked on was um, vehicle sensing uh, for a drone. So there's probably a range of applications that can be used for autonomous vehicles or drones. Uh, we focused on kind of like whether or not we could load the, the, the pod, the whole uh, development board onto a drone and see if we could detect an, an instruction um, using IR light. Uh, so collision avoidance is uh, one application of this, navigation uh, for drones and then aerial imaging. As vehicles of all stripes realize different levels of autonomy, the need for sensing technologies becomes more important, especially in close proximity to people and physical objects. With autonomous vehicles proliferating across sea, land, and air, the need for collision avoidance is universal. And in cases where low weight and low power are required, LSS is an optimal solution. To test the vehicle sensing capabilities of LSS, we 3D printed a housing to hold the Raspberry Pi, LSS, and IR lights that were then mounted to the undercarriage of the drone. The LSS made it possible to capture reflected IR light off nearby obstructions, which enabled the vehicle to autonomously avoid a crash by altering its course. As the markets for vehicle sensing grows beyond automotive, spurred on by autonomous technologies, LSS can provide a solution across established and emerging market verticals. 
in that last scene, <coughs> we were able to, uh, we got a 3DR drone which has a programmable API. And we were able to, um, in the backup, um, and that's the same thing that's back here, so again, I can answer some questions about that. So the third bucket that we were looking at were smart cities, and specifically intelligent roadways. What if you could provide a little package with you know, some wireless connectivity and magnets and power and put this on basically any street map in the city? You know, like um, city authorities could, could track traffic and patterns and, and whatnot throughout the city very inexpensively. Um, so a few applications that were kind of tied into this model were um, attaching to street lamps. So they can monitor traffic, optimization, speed, um, and also maybe roadside assistance if they detect that a car is, is nearby. Um, and we, we weren't able really to like go and deploy this throughout the city ourselves, <laughs> given the probably legal constraints and also the time that we have with the project. So we set up a, a model with these cars, these Anki drive cars, uh, that are um, riding on, they're kind of, you can use an app that, to drive them, but they basically run around the track using IR light. We also hacked the, the small cars and put our own IR LED um, diodes inside uh, to sort of simulate thermal IR detection that will be coming later as part of the analysis has talked about. And so we were able to set up a system that could model this. Imagine a city with intelligent infrastructure that makes it contextually aware in response to the needs of its citizens. A city with intelligent roadways that can track traffic patterns, speeds, congestion, and automatically deploy services for roadside assistance. LSS makes this possible by retrofitting roadside streetlights with inexpensive wireless sensors connected to a larger mesh network. The city optimizes traffic flow, resulting in less gridlocks and more responsive roadside assistance. In turn, Drivers benefit from shorter commute times, safer roads, and less pollution. Utilizing thermal IR, the LSS detects traffic flow in varying conditions and relays this information to a transit control center. Our prototype simulates this scenario by using near IR and LSS embedded in street lamps to track on-key cars as they drive at various speeds on the track. We're able to track the speeds of the cars, the level of congestion, and the need for roadside assistance. When no cars are present, we turn off the streetlights to conserve energy usage. Intelligent roadways can make our city safer, more efficient, and energy conscious. With Rambus LSS, Intelligent roadways become an affordable first step towards a smart city. So again, uh, the setup back here shows the 3D printed street lamps that we created in order to house the sensor and the LEDs and uh, the little cars. We also hacked. Um, and again, to jump off what uh, they were saying earlier, uh, we used the initial Rambus um, sort of practice programs that they provided and use that as a jump off point to continue to, to open the CPU and accomplish the task that we wanted to do in real time on the devices. Um, so just real quickly, some other potential applications that came out of our interviews with the, um, the experts were solar power. Um, they detect through heat signatures based on, uh, to, to tell how well that they're working and how efficient they are. And they fly drones over these. And so they were imagining some of the experts that we talked to that. LSS sensors could be attached um, to panels in a really cheap way to detect that um, without having to fly over. Um, a lot of manufacturing, you'll hear, uh, we heard about this from experts, and you'll hear more about this, I think, from IXDS. Uh, but one of the guys we talked to was an electrical engineer from an electric motorcycle manufacturer in Silicon Valley. He was really intrigued by the idea of uh, monitoring power or temperature of lithium ion batteries. This could be you know, in motorcycles, cars, airplanes, or whatever. Um, currently, they have like temperature sensors embedded inside of them that affect the manufacturing process. And so, this was really intriguing. And one of the, uh, I think, um, David Stork was really intrigued from that about this idea. Uh, and then, agriculture uses uh, monitoring crops. It just goes on and on. So.
Yeah, I think afterwards. Well, we should uh, complete and then we have a little break and there will be time for questions. Thanks a lot. Very, uh, very nice presentation. And yeah, as I said, I, I, we really hope to inspire today. I mean, I think we are entering a stage of permanent prototyping. Uh, there's so much new technology, societies and, and the individuals are changing and I think uh, the best way to approach it is through prototyping and so I really like this whole idea uh, to build these prototypes and uh, it, as said in, in a couple of minutes you will have time to come to our uh, workshop here in our tables and just uh, play with them, ask questions, as said the engineers are here from all three companies uh, and uh, we can, we can uh, talk through that. So now it's Christiane and myself from IXCS and we will kind of show uh, uh, the parts uh, uh, we did. But as said, this is an invitation for a, a joint brainstorming, for, a, 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 for further uh, yeah, discussing what that means and what do we want to be, uh, what do we want these sensors to be and where to use them. So I hope we inspire you for exactly that discussion. Okay, um, so let's, let's start. So basically what, how we, we dive into into um, our ideal finding is we looked at different areas and then within the areas we looked at um, upgrade, so upgrading an existing product with LSS, integral, part of the original design of a product, or auxiliary um, observing another object for changes. And then we had just a few um, of our ideas and then Within these ideas, we picked together with Ramos our favorites, and I think Lito, you have a favorite. <laughs> well, uh, one of the favorites which wasn't picked actually is uh, is here on top, the second row, the image. So due to its like low energy consumption and to the form factors, these sensors could be embedded into, for example, uh, cracks within large buildings or bridges, for example, and observe them for a really long period on change. And I think that's quite interesting that you that you kind of put a sensor somewhere and it, it just wakes up when something happens and then informs people and it's something on a very long time range. So it's not about a short, shortly measuring with a camera, but really saying, okay, don't relax. As soon as it gets worse, we will know about it. Um, another one that we saw was really interesting, but we didn't dive into it, is uh, the one up there in the middle. It's about... Um, basically a medical product that you can take in into different uh, fields or third world countries and then it's one time usage. Or even it's, an, it's uh, maybe together with the optical eye, it's some kind of eye test that you can send, um, send to your home, you take the test, uh, you throw parts away and the, the information, the data you send back to your eye doctor. Well, somehow we didn't end up with any of the disposable uh, parts of this product. And being uh, here at the Impact Hub, we, we, we are hosted by, a, uh, by a, a co-working space which is very serious about ecological things. I think it's okay, but still the idea of having this in packages or in medical uh, products which you only use one time, I think is, is something we are not used to because technology, especially visual technology, used to be so expensive. Okay, but now the one that we actually did dive into. Um, we'll start with assembly and maintenance. And this developed out of um, actually two ideas that we had. It was a smart screw, where you put the sense of the LSS into the screw, and then the alignment on the other side. Um, yeah, maybe some, <coughs> some words uh, why we chose uh, these things, and then we'll show the use case. But as I said, so it's again, again one thing which is uh, on a low energy uh, consumption, uh, um, the low energy consumption is an important feature of that use case, uh, the, uh, the disposability in especially manufacturing, so you will see that in certain manufacturing it's okay to have parts which then will never be used again, but they improve the manufacturing process. And uh, again, the, uh, with the screw example, and you will discuss this, this like long battery last. So we talked to a guy at uh, 
uh, Airbus. And he explained that uh, bringing these huge airplane parts together is such a precision work. It takes a long time and there's hardly any tools. So the idea is, and it's not only in airplane manufacturing, but also in other uh, on-site uh, construction. Wings, wind mills, especially today, we have the, you know, the environment influences like wind and water. And so uh, uh, that's how this idea came, and, and we got really positive feedback on that. And as I said, so afterwards, you never need this sensor again. But you can use it again, so you either disable it, or as you see in the next one, you let it live, and then it's really um, easy for example um, in the airplane to see, hey, is there any screw to move, is it loose, and you can do maintenance. And one of the ideas technically which I, which I would like to see in the next phase is like using RFID ways of, use, of getting energy. So there is maybe not even a battery afterwards inside because you just, in the screw for example, but so you, you just check it and you give the energy when you check. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here again, you have the little diagrams, you can see the screw where the LSS sits, and then the alignment that comes from the other side. And this is basically... Again, okay, what you basically see, that was uh, what we showed to, to, uh, to the Airbus people and discussed earlier. But you will be able to see the prototype later on. So, so this, is, this is again how the, how the prototype works. Yeah. I think we should skip okay. that part so but that we have more time for, for <laughs> socializing. Yes. Okay. So then the next use case, the toy car. To yeah, I mean, uh, uh, toys are really such an important thing uh, because they kind of uh, have, first of all, economical constraints which are for designers quite challenging. Uh, they have to be extremely cheap, basically, because you, you, you need a, a very high uh, uh, amount of money to market them, to, to sell them, etc. And, uh, and second, I think they, they could be smarter. I really think they could introduce, for example, basic foundation of programming to kids. We just did a research at my university on that. And how can we, I mean, you know, bricks and you learn uh, cause and uh, effect. That's quite easy for kids, but to learn what programming means and what impact it has is really a big challenge. And so we kind of decided together with the entire group uh, to look into toys and what we uh, came up with, with, you will see in a second, but again, so the low cost is of course one of the key features of this sensor which allows it to become maybe a, a, a changing technology for the toy industry. And the other one, which we shall not forget, it's all about algorithms. So if this sensor is going to be programmed, uh, and please re uh, correct me, uh, uh, for certain recognition, then it can do it really cheap and very fast. So it's not a universal camera, but if we say we want to recognize certain symbols or certain letters, uh, then the algorithm will be written for exactly that task, and then it's very, it doesn't even need uh, too much of computing power because it's focusing only on that, and I think that's a, uh, this example is showing this this, uh, this feature quite well. Just one more point on that, like, uh, you know, it, it's actually not just the algorithm alone, it's the combination of the design of the grading and the algorithms that are coupled to that design. So to your point, they can be optimized, but it would be a combination of both grading and algorithm. Okay, thanks. <coughs> What if you could design your own racetrack on any surface you wanted? And toy cars had eyes to follow it on their own. What if you could draw your own symbols onto the track? Program their actions. Through testing and developing, 
the sensor was able to recognize its position relative to a line and recognize key symbols that trigger another action. This early prototype demonstrates the potential of the visual sensor. Assisted with LED headlights, the prototype can read the ground in front of it and negotiate a course. Unlike other sensors common in toys, the visual basis of the LSS allows the toy to react directly to visual stimuli in the world around it. The shape of the track is limited only by the user's imagination, offering a unique experience. So I think uh, one of the big challenges with the IoT is really how to control that. I mean, things are getting so small, so maybe gesture will be a really important part of that. And so we, 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 we decided to go into showing the capabilities of the center also on the gesture part, uh, uh, side of things. And we decided to do it on, a, on an object which is actually quite challenging because it's, uh, it has a tiny screen. And I mean, mostly it's being owned by men with huge fingers. And so how can we address this using this new technology? Okay. There was a way to control your smartwatch without touching the screen. With LSS technology, interactions can happen anywhere near the device. The sensor is able to recognize tapping, dragging, and pinching gestures. The LSS captures enough information to enable a host of new high fidelity interactions. This new technology allows the use of broad gestures to interact in situations such as jogging or biking. At the heart of these possibilities lies the new LSS from Rampus. A tiny lightweight imaging sensor with an incredibly low power consumption. By using a diffraction grating instead of a traditional optical lens, the LSS achieves comparable results at a fraction of the price. The prototype uses a red light floor to illuminate the user's fingers whenever they are in close proximity to the device. Employing two LSS at the same time triangulates a precise position from the image data. In addition, the sensor's 2D resolution allows extraction of additional interactions, like dragging, rotating, pinching, and tilting. LSS opens up new possibilities for the future for wearable interactions. So I think uh, um, uh, yeah, again we have the prototype here. You can you can try it on, and it's a little bigger than a regular watch right now, but that's a little bit more due to the casing right, uh, which we received in the development kit, but as you heard, this is all just a question now of how to proceed and how to proceed into the industry and with packaging. But uh, I really think what is uh, what uh, what you saw today is, first of all, as you heard, it's a, it was a basically four-week prototyping phase. So I mean, this is really what I think is, is important in that domain, quickly build prototypes and then discuss them, and I think it's really nice to see that both Brock and ICS were able to work with this technology and come up with these prototypes and I think it's really, as said, is an invi in invitation to continue this exploration and to talk, as it said, it, as it is something which is in development from Rambus, to be part of that development and to come up with whatever could be interesting in your field. <laughs>